I uh, am a professor of agricultural economics in the at K State. Um, I also serve the role as department head. Um, today, what we're going to look at is essentially agricultural net income, what the situation is for the uh, property tax calculations. Last week, we talked a little bit with what was going on in the market for land values. Um, it's important to, uh, to realize that the uh, um, net income situation for property tax calculations um, is a different process. And in some cases, it will follow the market better or worse than, than others. And so um, certainly that's there. And so a lot of times there is a paradox between what's been going on with regards to uh, um, income from land and the property tax appraisals. Um, sometimes you'll have a situation where um, the uh, um, farming returns are going down and uh, um, the uh, um, landlord net income for property tax continues to go up and sometimes you'll have the, uh, the converse. And, and so certainly that can create um, some frustration um, with regards to, uh, to what is going on. Part of that is due to the way that the legislation um, sets the computation, what's included and uh, what isn't included. Um, we will spend some time talking about the uh, calculation of the landlord net income for property tax considerations. Um, it is important to realize that it's a formula-based um, calculation um, set by um, Kansas statute. We will look at uh, what's happening currently in terms of what uh, um, um, statewide is going on with the uh, 2021 values that uh, most of you, um, I assume, have already received at the end of end of March. But uh, um, we will present some information um, from a um, statewide basis. And then this uh, last legislation um, period, there was a uh, um, proposal to uh, essentially look at a formula change, um, kind of moving from an eight-year moving average to just an eight year simple average. And uh, we'll spend some time um, taking a look at what that would mean um, from a potential um, um, property tax, at least in terms of the landlord net income. Um, that legislation at, at uh, the last that I've known of um, did not uh, um, go forward this year, but uh, Again, I think it is important to have a little bit of thought process with regards to what may change. One of the things that's very difficult is basically just getting cash rent information. And this is uh, um, NAS, the National Agricultural Statistics Service cash rent for Barton County. One of the things you'll see is there wasn't an estimate for 2015, 2018. And that does make it very difficult in that not all counties in the state of Kansas have cash rent information for each year. Um, and so a lot of times you'll end up smoothing that. And obviously the uh, 2021 numbers will not come out until um, the uh, August reporting period. Usually the second or third week of, of August is, is when the 2021 cash rent information um, will be provided. In terms of uh, Barton County, and I chose Barton County simply, it's one of the uh, center of the state counties. Um, um, we could get this information to you for, for different counties, but uh, essentially um, in 2021, the uh, um, land rental was 3650. It increased on a year by year basis until either 2015 or 2016. Um, 2016 was 4750. And then it's begun to decrease, and the 2020 number was five dollars um, less than what uh, was recorded just uh, um, um, five years sooner in terms of uh, the uh, 2016 numbers. And so, essentially, over this 10-year uh, um, period, essentially um, land values increased from 36.50, or cash rents increased from 36.50 to 47.50. Um, an increase of $11, and then they dropped off. If you look at the landlord net income, um, you can kind of uh, see what the eight-year average was over this period of time. Um, 
and this would be the average for Barton County for non-irrigated land. Um, certainly the uh, um, cash rent values from NAS are also um, non-irrigated cropland. Um, one of the things you'll see is that uh, from 2011 to 2012, it dropped. And then after that, um, from 2012 all the way through um, 2019, the uh, um, cash rents increased from 2724 all the way up to uh, 4657. And then in 2020, there was a slight decrease um, from 4657 to 4610. Um, and then from uh, 2020 to 2021, there was a decrease of uh, 4610, um, 4533. And so in terms of looking at this, one of the things you can see is that cash rents adjust a little bit quicker than uh, um, the uh, landlord net income. Um, in terms of the net landlord net income tends to be fairly smooth from year to year where you don't have lots of up and down cycles in, in terms of it tends to follow a fairly smooth pattern um, just as the uh, um, cash rents do in, in terms of uh, um, you end up looking at that. Early in the period, cash rents were um, quite a bit higher than what the uh, um, um, landlord net income was. And then um, more recently, um, we've seen a switch where um, landlord net incomes are a little bit higher um, than the uh, cash rental values from um, the uh, National Egg Statistics Service. If you look at the statute in the uh, process is set forth in uh, um, the Kansas statute 79-1476. Um, basically, um, it's done on a share um, income perspective. Um, and so it's the share of net income from various land classes um, normally received by the landlord. And this is the basis of determining agricultural income for all land except pasture or rangeland. Um, the pasture and late rangeland process is a little bit different. Um, the net income normally received should be determined by de de deducting expenses normally incurred by the landlord from the share of gross income normally received by the landlord. And so again, it kind of talks about the aspect that uh, um, expenses paid by the landlord are subtracted from the revenue um, received by the landlord. Um, from pasture or rangeland, what's done there is that each homogeneous region, um, there isn't uh, pasture or rangeland um, information at the county basis. And so what's done there is the uh, um, crop reporting district, the nine homogeneous regions in Kansas. And uh, so uh, um, that net rental or cash rental income received by the landlord is used to determine um, the agricultural income from pasture land. And so for irrigated and non-irrigated land, the uh, process is a little bit different um, from that. Um, for um, the uh, pasture and rangeland, essentially there's a cash rent um, used and then landlord expenses are deducted from that. Um, for agricultural land, um, crop land, um, either irrigated or non-irrigated, essentially commodity prices, crop yields, um, and then the expenses are going to be based on eight calendar years immediately preceding the calendar year. In terms of uh, the net income, basically is then capitalized. And so there's two parts of the formula. The first part is basically trying to get something equivalent to a rental rate. And then the second part is uh, looking at the capitalization rate. You see the statute here. Um, basically it's a five year period on federal land bank loans, July 1. Um, except the important thing to realize is that for property tax years 2003 and after, it shall not be um, less than 11 nor more than 12. And so the capitalization rate is very much fixed in the statute between this 11 and 12% level. And so essentially, let's say, for example, you had a landlord net income of $30 per acre. You would divide that by somewhere between 0 0.11 
or 0.12, and that would give you the use value um, for property tax purposes. Um, and so after 2003, that capitalization rate is between 11% and 12%. And um, for those that work in the industry, certainly those rates are quite a bit um, more than uh, um, what the market capitalization rate is um, with regards to that. And, and so last week, um, um, Robin in the uh, seminar talked a little bit about the uh, um, cap rates um, in uh, um, or rent to value rates and they're the same cap rates in uh, the market. And so um, that 11 to 12. Um, expenses are those that are typically incurred in producing the plants, animals, or products described above. Um, they do include management fees, and so there's a management fee in there. Um, all of the variable uh, production costs that uh, are paid by the landlord are there, um, including, for example, maintenance and depreciation offenses. But if, if seed is shared or fertilizer is shared, um, that would be deducted from the income. And then certainly um, if it's irrigated, irrigation wells, irrigation laterals are going to be um, subtracted. And then also this does um, deduct real estate taxes. Um, and so the uh, county real estate taxes are deducted from this. Um, the uh, should not um, have expenses that are temporary or permanent buildings. And so um, basically any building um, aspect is, is not there. And so the goal here is to uh, um, calculate the landlord share, um, either starting with a cash rent for pasture or kind of a net income approach, or a, the easiest way to think of it is a share rent approach for um, cropland and irrigated land. Um, the uh, um, pasture is uh, done on a region basis. The uh, um, cropland, both irrigated and uh, non-irrigated, are on a county basis. Um, in terms of crop mix, we uh, um, use or what is used is anything with 5% or more planted acres in a county. And so, um, for example, um, cotton is, is one of the crops that sometimes enters, sometimes doesn't, um, just depending on whether or not more than 5% of the planted acres in the county are, are done um, from a cropland perspective. Um, probably what's most important is government program payments are excluded. And so um, um, certainly with the uh, um, um, increase in government program payments, those are excluded. Um, also crop insurance is excluded. And so there is an, no assumption of crop insurance proceeds or expenses, nor are there any government program payments um, that uh, would uh, um, be dispersed on a share basis, um, those are also e excluded. And, and so um, basically this is just looking at the uh, raw market return um, from the, the uh, um, cash rental um, type basis. What is currently, and this is uh, um, used as an, or what's currently done is a, basically an eight year average of an eight year average. Um, because yields are so variable from year to year, from county to county, um, essentially um, the previous eight years are used in an eight year average for the return to landlord. The uh, um, thought behind this is to essentially have more of a smoother process um, such that uh, um, um, the use value is not going to go up and down from year to year, that it's going to be more on a longer range, um, smooth aspect, as opposed to um, varying um, year to year. Um, this eight-year average then is then capitalized at the statute defined capitalization rate. That's the 11 and 12%. The important thing to realize is that the process places more weight on the middle years of the process, and we'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, and uh, um, the landlord net return, for example, the 2021 landlord net income is made up of individual values from 2005 to uh, um, 2019. To get a schematic of that, essentially there's a, about a 1.6% probability of the 2005 and the 2019. And then this goes up um, 
by um, uh, essentially uh, an eighth um, each year, um, such that uh, in 12, 2012, which is the middle year from this computation process, um, has a 12.5% rate. And so essentially, um, we're adding a little bit each year, these probabilities sum to one, um, but it is weighted um, with regards to that. In terms of looking at this, what I've done here is basically give you the single year landlord net return for Barton County um, from 1998 to 2019. And again, this is using the formula without government program payments and without crop insurance. And you can see from 1998 till about 2006, um, the uh, um, landlord net income kind of fluctuated um, between 20 and $30. Um, certainly there were years that were up, certainly there were years that were down. And again, that's just inherent in the uh, um, agricultural production product. Uh, process with regards to variable prices, variable weather um, that causes variable yields. And uh, so certainly um, you're going to see some of the up and down there that from a um, government perspective, you probably don't want um, the uh, um, value that is assessed to go up and down. It just makes it difficult for um, um, county um, and uh, school district entities to plan for what that budget might be. Then in Barton County, in terms of the first big spike in incomes, kind of in this uh, 2008 period, um, basically um, increased that LNI um, up until um, a little bit over 70. Then that kind of dropped off through 2012, 2013 till 40. Then it then doubled over the next year. Um, very short time, it jumped up to um, $80 per acre. And then it's dropped down all the way in 2016 to about $15 per acre. And then it ended up gradually increasing back to about 25. And so in some respects, the uh, L&I from the market, which would be a, a cash share from the market, um, excluding government program payments is about where it was in uh, 1980, 1998. But certainly there was a lot of um, variability um, between that. What I've done here is for um, the last 10 years, I've graphed the LNI over the individual years. And so you just see the one spike there, um, but you can end up seeing where, for example, there'll be cases um, where the uh, LNI continues to go up where as the single year LNIs go down. Um, and um, again, it does give you kind of a smoother adjustment process. To look forward in terms of uh, how this uh, um, is looking at this, uh, essentially I have the weights used in 2014, which constituted 1998 to 2012. And uh, essentially you can see that there, the uh, um, uh, major weight um, is uh, kind of in, in the middle there in terms of uh, 2005. And so looking at this, you can end up seeing how, again, this moves forward and how these individual weights begin to come in. Um, in 2015, we're getting more of that uh, $70 um, return. Um, and essentially um, for the weight in 2017 basically peaked that one. And then you can see that uh, um, the second peak is beginning to indicate or go in. And um, again, you can kind of see where we are. Um, one of the things once we get to uh, um, 2019, um, 2018, um, you see that uh, the first peak is beginning to go down in weight. And so it becomes less relevant. Um, the second peak is, is still increasing relevance with regards to that. Um, if you go all the way to 2021, you'll see that uh, that second peak of $80 per um, year. Um, next year we'll have the most weight. And then after that, it will um, end up de decreasing. Um, and, and so in some respects, when you have these high income years or especially low income years, it's almost kind of like um, the rodent um, going through the snake um, as, as time goes on in terms of the, the bulge um, um, is, is weighted over time. And so that gives a little bit of an indication simply how these different years are averaged. And 
If we would use just a straight eight year, essentially it would be an equal weight. And so instead of a triangle, um, you would just have a rectangle that would be taking in those years. And uh, in, in some respects, uh, older years would be removed quicker. Um, but if you had one very high year, it would immediately jump in at a weight of 12.5%. And so one year, if you had a peak of one year, essentially that's going to um, move those values um, very, very quickly. Um, and so people could argue whether or not that's good or bad, um, but that's kind of how the process works. Again, to look at this from 2013 all the way to 2021, and this is kind of the tax year, um, you can see it went from 29.44 in Barton County up to 46.57, um, and then it has dropped off. And so you can see that early on, um, as those uh, high profitable years were uh, um, taking more and more effect, the uh, uh, percentage change from years to year um, were pretty high, approaching 11% from 2014 to 2015. Um, since then, um, with no other peak years, um, you're seeing this thing level. Um, the last year of increase in Barton County um, was 2018 to 2019, where there was a 1.3% increase. Um, from 2019 to 2020, there was a negative one. And from uh, um, 20 to 21, there was a negative 1.7%. And um, on uh, cropland, um, you'll see sim similar patterns with regards to um, over time, just what was going on from um, this landlord net income. I've uh, graphed the last three years um, for different districts. And again, this is using non-irrigated. I use dry land here, but uh, um, my agronomist friends don't like dry land. They like non-irrigated, in, in, but uh, um, my font fit better with dry land. But uh, in terms of looking at this, you can kind of look at the uh, um, percentage change that's occurred from 19 to 20 and then from 20 to 21. And this is for the average. And again, this is going to be differential um, based on the quality of land. But for non-irrigated land, um, Sumner um, basically saw a decrease of 1.8 from uh, um, 20 to 21. Um, Marshall saw an increase of 4%. Um, Anderson um, saw an increase in 5.3%. Butler, 3.5%. And so in some respects, you can see that the eastern part um, of Kansas, kind of that northeast corner, um, um, as, was actually looking at increases. Um, Jewel um, in North Central basically saw a decrease of 0.8%. Um, Ford in the Southwest um, was negative 8%, Greeley negative 3.8%, and then Thomas in, in the Northwest. And so um, that gives you a little bit of an indication of just what the average LNI is for those counties. And so you can see it's a high of 101, uh, 102.10. Um, down to a low of uh, um, 1591 um, in, in Greeley County. Um, and uh, again, that's not probably the highest in, in the state in Marshall County, but um, of the counties that I used, it, it was the high. If you look at irrigated land, um, essentially you can kind of see the process for um, essentially um, six different uh, um, regions. I ended up uh, using a 300 foot well, and these numbers are adjusted for um, the depth of well. Um, obviously, if you have a deeper well, pumping costs are gonna be higher than a um, shallower well. And, and so that's accounted for in the cost of pumping water. And uh, so uh, um, looking at this in, in terms of uh, Northwest Kansas, a 300 foot well, um, basically you're looking at an 8940 LNI, decreased 3.3% from 20 to 21. Um, one of the things you'll see in all regions, but the South Central, you uh, saw a decrease. Um, and then you can see in terms of what the LNIs are, um, North Central was 132. Um, in, in terms of uh, Central was 69. Um, South Central was 80. Um, Southwest 74. West Central 69. And then 89. But uh, it does give you a little bit of an idea um, and again, these do differ, differ by the, the well depth. The uh, last thing is time, kind of taking a look at the pasture, and these are done at a district basis instead of a county basis. 
And uh, one of the things you can end up seeing is that uh, in uh, 2020 to 2021, um, all but the West Central increase, you see a pretty high percentage increase. But I think it's important to remember that uh, um, from 19 to 20, you was moving from a 26 to a 175, hence a 573%. And then uh, from 175 to 227 is about a 30% increase. But uh, again, you're looking at uh, a very low um, pasture. And this is for native pasture. There's also uh, information on tame pasture, um, where tame pasture is, is appropriate for um, those, those districts. But uh, again, um, in uh, um, 2021, we see kind of a different on average for the district from 1574 all the way down to 227. And again, these are adjusted by the quality of land from county to county. And so, for example, if a one county has within that district higher um, quality of land, they're going to see LNIs higher. If they have a lower on average quality than what's in the district, they're going to see a lower. And so um, essentially the uh, um, um, numbers are essentially normalized such that the average for the district will be 1574. Um, but counties that have better productivity um, will see higher numbers. Counties that have below average productivity um, will see um, lower lower numbers. Um, this is a map. And again, this one is hard to read. I would encourage you just kind of to print this out um, and, and take a look at it. But this is kind of basically the uh, um, 20 to 21 change. And so essentially the number on top is the 2021 number by county. Um, the uh, 2020 number is in the middle. And then the percent change from 18 to 19, or this would be 20 to 21 tax years, it's 18 to 19 um, production years. Um, and, and so you can kind of take a look at what's going on from a non-irrigated land perspective there. And again, these numbers are small, but I would encourage you to take a look at the graphs and uh, um, um, kind of be able to pick those out in terms of uh, what happened on a countywide um, basis. But it, again, you can see some, some differences there um, in terms of the highest LNI is uh, actually in uh, Jefferson County, I believe, at 120. And then the uh, lowest LNI um, is all the way out in Morton County of about 323. And so you can see um, fairly large differences with regards to that. To summarize kind of what happened from 20 to 21, 45 for non-irrigated land um, increased, 60 decreased. And so essentially um, you had roughly about the same amount of counties that are increasing decreases. Um, the biggest dollar change was 683 um, from Donovan in the east um, to negative $2.27 for Stevens County in, uh, in the west. And then that percentage range um, for the year, basically the highest increase was 7.2%. And then the lowest is negative uh, 40%. And again, those big changes in percentages are usually from counties, obviously, that have pretty small LNIs. Um, I looked at the same type of thing for irrigated using a 200 foot depth across the state. Um, in, in terms of uh, the LNI is actually decreased in all districts except South Central. Um, and then the changes range from 80 cents to negative $2.38. So a little tighter range in the irrigated. Um, and so from a county to county, the percentage change um, did not, uh, um, was not as great as you uh, um, saw on uh, non-irrigated land. And then in terms of pasture, um, basically um, we calculate these both for native and tame grass. Um, and uh, the LNIs increased for native and tame grass in all districts except West Central for the native. Um, the changes were relatively small on an LNI basis, um, negative 22 cents to 0.73 cents or 73 cents in dollar terms. On a percentage change, it's pretty high. Um, in terms of it goes as high uh, to 29.7%. But again, that's a county with a fairly low LNI. At most, for example, that change was 73 cents an acre. Um, and uh, so if you would divide 73 by 0.11, um, 
essentially what that would do to land would be probably a six to $7 increase in use value um, for an acre of, of native. And then if you look at uh, essentially tame grass, um, all um, from 20 to 21, all increased. Basically the L and I change most or least by 34 cents, most by $1.59. And so on a percentage basis, those can look high. But again, if you take uh, um, um, roughly $2 and divide it by 0.11, um, at most you're getting um, probably um, a uh, um, 10, 11, $12 change on average with, with regards to those values. To uh, switch gears here a little bit, um, there was a House Bill 2023 introduced in the legislature, um, but uh, it doesn't seem to have moved. And if you want to take a look at it, um, essentially, um, I have the website there. And, and so um, that's going to be there. But uh, the uh, um, legislation was for all taxable years um, commencing after December 31, 2022. Um, essentially, it would be basically just an eight year average as opposed to an eight year average of an eight year average. Um, and so um, the big change there would be um, removing that uh, triangle perspective that does um, keep values from adjusting quite as quickly um, to a process um, where they will adjust um, a little bit quicker. What we ended up doing is we ended up uh, with uh, Leah's help and Leah did most of the work and uh, um, she's also on the uh, um, um, Zoom session here today. But uh, she went ahead and calculated all of these um, from a county by county perspective for non-irrigated land to just get a picture of uh, what's going on. Since we've been looking at Barton County, um, essentially we have, um, kind of what's going on in terms of you have the green line, which is the LNI, you have the purple line, which is the individual years, and then you have the uh, red line, which would just be the simple eight years. And so in terms of looking at this, one of the things you'll see is that using an eight-year average and, and bringing in those high income years at a higher weight more rapidly is going to increase um, the uh, um, LNI for years when incomes are relatively high, and then they'll end up uh, decreasing um, the uh, um, downside there. And so in some respects, you see that the eight-year average LNI is higher, sometimes it, it's lower. Um, but the big thing there is that uh, um, basically the years, the end years in terms of uh, 2019, 18, 17 are gonna have more weight quicker. And then for example, the high year of 2013 is gonna have a high year quicker. And so when you see from 2012 to 2013 to go in, essentially you're moving the LNI from about $44, $45 to $53 in, in one year. And then as that goes off, you can see that uh, you have a pretty um, um, rapid decrease in the LNIs, which would drop the uh, um, use value fairly substantially. And so, um, from 2015 to 2019, essentially the uh, use value would have fallen um, by roughly about $20 per acre. And you multiply that by a factor of um, eight or nine, and that would end up uh, um, giving you a um, change in, in land values by um, roughly um, 20 times nine would be $180. And so essentially you're gonna see um, the use value land values um, move a little bit more quickly. The other thing that could cause a policy concern and a um, um, concern for um, those that rely on agricultural land for property tax values within the county, um, certainly school districts, is the turning points. And so on a county by county basis, and we just did this um, for the average of the county, we ended up determining how many turning points um, would have occurred over a 10 year period. And so essentially we have 10 years of observation where we look at uh, the eight year current situation moving average. One of the things we'll see over this 10 year period, we basically had a change in direction or a change in trend, uh, an average of two times. Um, in terms of there were no cases where there wasn't a change in trend over the 10 year period. 
Um, there were 27 counties where there was just one change in direction over the 10 year period. Um, 57 counties had two directions. So they had a change going from up to down and then, or um, down to up and then up to down, for example. And then uh, three changes, 20 counties, and then four changes, one, one county. Um, if you look at a simple average, and in some respects, it will adjust um, those use values higher or more quickly. Um, but the issue is, is there's going to be more situations where it'll go up what year, one year, go down one year, simply because of the year that's being brought on or, or leaving. And so uh, looking at this, um, 47 counties had just one change in direction. Um, eight counties had two changes in direction. Um, three counties had, uh, or 33 counties had three changes in direction. Um, 12 counties, four changes, and then five. And there was actually one county that over this period of time had essentially six times where it switched from going up to down. And so it, in some respects, there's just gonna be a lot of variability there. I've kind of drawn a couple things with regards to um, what may happen in, in, in certain counties. Um, I've uh, chosen one in the Southwest, certainly Finney County. In terms of one of the things you can look at that LNI and, and basically look at uh, how that uh, is up and down and, and the changes from year to year. Um, I do have the LNI for the green line that basically is the current system of uh, um, determining what that uh, cash share rent rate would be that would be capitalized. And then essentially you have the, the red line. Um, one of the things again, and you're gonna see this all the time is it's gonna adjust quicker um, to higher income years. It'll also adjust quicker to low income years. Um, and so um, um, that's one county. And then the other one I chose with Jefferson County. And, and here you have a situation where you actually had five turning points. And so essentially it increased up until 211, then from 211 to 212, it would decrease, then it increased through 2015. Then 2017, your use value would uh, um, um, stop decreasing and increasing. 2018, it then changed again to, to further decrease. And so you are going to have kind of some up and downs with regards to those, those appraisers. Um, but again, um, it does adjust more quickly. Um, and, and so basically, I think that's the trade-off that the uh, um, policymakers um, do need to uh, determine. And then um, the last thing we did, and there's going to be a lot more discussion of this next week in terms of uh, net farm income, but the uh, um, numbers are starting to be posted on the eggmanager.info website. And so what I ended up doing over the last five years is I looked at what the net farm income would be without government program payments and without crop insurance. And so essentially I eliminated crop insurance and I eliminated the government program payments and basically kind of gave you kind of what the net income would be. Where this matters is this can give you a little bit of a clue in terms of once the 2020 numbers are determined whether or not they're going to increase or decrease. And so if you look at a statewide level, essentially you go from that uh, blue line in 2019 of an income of about uh, 20,000 without government program payments statewide, um, that increases to about 52,000. Um, and so with this, it's very likely that when we're looking at these LNIs next year, you will see that 2020 is gonna be a, um, um, increased year where it will put upward pressure on those. Probably the only part in the state where that isn't going to occur is in the Northwest region. In terms of there, you see that if they would eliminate all government program payments in both the livestock and the crops, and then also the crop insurance, um, you're looking at uh, last year of a negative 68,000 net farm income. Um, the other um, areas, you had a uh, little bit over 70,000 in both the North Central and Northeast, um, about 93,000, 94 for the Southwest. Um, South Central um, had an outstanding year in uh, 2020. And then um, you have the Southeast. But in each of those cases, if you compare the pink line and the blue line, all but the Northwest, it's very likely that when you look at your 
um, 2022 um, LNIs for the county, it's probably going to end up uh, um, beginning perhaps to push that up um, a, a little bit with regards to that. Um, but again, stay tuned for what the actual numbers are in terms of net farm income, in terms of, like I said, I've um, subtracted off the government program payments and um, the uh, um, um, crop insurance uh, proceeds and crop insurance expenses. Um, and, and, and so once those are added in, these pink lines will be quite different. And again, um, Kevin Herbel and uh, um, Mark Dykeman will talk about those. And then Greg Ibendahl will look at um, what he's thinking with regards to 2021 incomes and 22 to, or 2022 incomes. Too many 20s in there. So um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an indication. Um, real estate values on non-irrigated land, I think will likely decrease probably another year. Um, while incomes are high, much of the income in 2020 is going to come through, it's not coming through the market, it's coming through government program payments. And so essentially, I think we'll see probably another year in 2020, um, once those numbers are added in for the 22 pro tax, property tax season, is probably going to end up uh, not being a very um, high number. Um, I think the trends will continue to go down. Um, I think this may change when uh, the 23 tax property tax numbers are coming out. Um, if you look at the irrigated land, basically you're going to see percentage changes very similar to non-irrigated. Um, property tax on pasture is probably going to be fairly stable over time. I don't think you'll see much decrease. I think you'll see um, continued increase. Um, in terms of uh, if there was a change, um, such as what was proposed, in uh, the uh, legislation 2033. Um, uh, essentially, this would cause a quicker adjustment. And so the LNIs would increase in good years quicker, and they would decrease in poor income years quicker. And so this would likely increase the volatility of year-to-year -year LNIs and use value land changes. Um, and again, people can argue this on both sides, whether or not that would be good or bad, whether or not um, they would rather have a situation where the numbers did not move very dramatically, um, but you would have years where property taxes did not go down when um, the profitability of farming went down. Um, conversely, property values may not go up when the profitability of farming is very good. It may not go as high. And so essentially the eight year straight eight year average kind of has the benefit is they move quicker. Um, the downside is, is that the volatility is going to be um, much more than it is current. And so with that, again, hopefully this made sense. Um, we'll open it up to questions. If there's anything in the chat, um, that would be great. Or if you wanna unmike and jump in, I think we can do that. I think Rich, it has that technology such that we can have a conversation. Um, I can't see Rich shaking his head no because uh, um, he doesn't have his camera on, but. I have opened it up so folks can unmute and talk to you if they want to. And that, oops, Alan, you got muted on that. Sorry there. In order to unmute everybody, I have to mute everybody. Okay. So, uh, um, but uh, in terms of looking at, at this, hopefully this gives you a better understanding of uh, where the uh, use values are. Um, again, it's a policy related um, process. Um, it doesn't 100% um, follow market value. On average, probably either um, policy will end up whether or not it's an eight-year moving average or an eight-year average. On average, the uh, property tax or the uh, um, use values will be the same on average. It's just how quickly they adjust, whether or not it's a slower process or whether or not it's a faster process. And again, um, different individuals um, would probably come up with different policy solutions to that. Questions? How do we do this? I do hear you, Cliff. <laughs> hey, Alan, real basic question here. Uh, 
I'm trying to think, is this like, is this the process or the policy that every individual county uses? I mean, a real basic question, because I, I, I didn't, I just assumed every county made its own decisions about how to, uh, you know, factor in property tax rates based on, you know, what had happened with income in their area. I mean, I'm just trying to think of my particular county, which is Stevens, and I'm just, I'm going to go back and look, but I'm just, I'm not really sure that our property tax rates um matched you know i mean maybe maybe they did but i just got the feeling it didn't really match that pattern that you're talking about in terms of it is going to differ from county to county but they all use the same calculation process and and so for example the incomes may follow a different pattern in barton than they did in in stevens county and so from a aspect that everybody's using the same formula across the state, the same process, obviously different numbers. Um, that is true. And then the other thing is that these are adjusted for soil um, quality. Mm -hmm. And so basically um, that is going to be uh, adjusted. And so the counties, um, basically, if you have above average soil for the county, um, your taxes or your LNI and your use value is going to be higher. If you have below um, um, quality land, they're going to um, um, be a little bit less. One of the things that uh, occurs in the western part that sometimes um, affects the formula a little bit is sometimes the crop LNIs go negative. And, and uh -huh. so at that point, I think they put a floor on um, that they won't fall mm -hmm. below the uh, um, pasture rent. Okay, so, but if I look at it, I should look at what the assessed values of the property are, right? Because in our area, we've got a lot of oil and gas, and then there's been, you know, in terms of the uh, the actual tax rates themselves, they've varied quite a bit because of what's happened with the economy in other areas, mm -hmm. and that affects what, you know, but I should look at the assessed, at, at when the assessor comes in, when they come in and appraise it every year, I ought to, I ought to look at what the rates are that they use there, right? Correct, because obviously, for example, based on the economy, more revenue is needed or not, and so they'll adjust the mill rate up or yeah. down to get right. to get the needs. And so, your property tax bill could be disconnected from your agricultural use value, um, depending on whether or not that mill rate goes up or down. And so, um, you just can't compare property taxes from year to year um, simply because what that mill rate is assessed by the school districts in the county um, can end up differing from 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 year year to year. And, and so you do, like you said, have to go back and look at the assessed use use values. Just like on your home, if you have a if you own a home, essentially each uh, March they send out kind of okay, this is your assessed value um, for this next yeah. year. And then after that, um, the uh, counties and school districts work their magic trying to figure out what, uh, what they need. Um, the big thing with a lot of variation in agricultural use values is that mill levy will bounce around a lot more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that certainly for school districts and counties trying to set their budget um, can, can be a headache in that nobody likes to hear that their mill is going up. They kind of want more stability in that. Hmm. Okay, that helps me a lot because I never really realized that there was, uh, you know, that 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 one component. I understand the mill rate fluctuating, which has really hit us. But the the component of how the property is assessed, its value is assessed. There should be, you know, there should be this uh, methodology uh, that that should apply wherever you are. So that's that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. John has a question in the thing. Um, property taxes are supposed to be 11 to 12% of the um, calculated net landlord income. Um, that's not quite correct. What it is, is you take the LNI and divide it by 11 to 12%. And there's usually a property tax on there. So that percentage sometimes can be up to 13, 14, 15%. And so for example, if you have a 30, um, LNI, you would divide that by 0.11. And that would give you what the assessed value of the agricultural land is, at which point, I think they use 30% um, and then multiply that by the mill. And so there's a couple other numbers in there in order to get your property tax. But essentially, you take the LNI and divide it by that cap rate 
divide it by the 11 or 12 percent. Does that help, John? And Keith has a question. It's not an Olympic average, and that is correct. Um, in terms of essentially each of the years count, um, but uh, um, the current method, um, they will count anywhere from 1.6% of the total value to 12.5%. To, um, um, and so um, it is an Olympic average where you throw out the high or low. Um, certainly that's been proposed. Um, and the issue there is um, how many years to use and then um, um, those type of things. But uh, right now, each year is used um, through the process. But it is important to realize that um, the, in terms of crop insurance is not included. And so those will go, um, can go fairly low in a poor year um, where you don't have crop insurance or government program payments um, providing that safety net. And so um, these individual LNIs can go um, high or low um, because there is no safety net included in the uh, computation. Does that help, Keith? And again, anything that's uh, formula-based is open to differential opinions in terms of how to, uh, um, how to uh, compute it, whether or not it be five years, 10 years, um, whether or not you use a, a kind of a, a, a slow phase in, slow phase out, or whether or not you use a quick phase in, phase out. Um, again, those are all policy prescriptions that the legislature determines. And um, um, uh, essentially um, the uh, moving average method kind of where you have this triangle waiting period um, is what is currently used to at least get the LNI, um, which is then divided by that cap rate, which again, when you saw in the statute after 2003, it's pretty much been between 11 and 12% according to the statute. Any other questions before we let you go? Again, a lot of computations, lots of numbers. I think the important things to remember, um, no government program payments are included, no crop insurance is um, included. And so that does um, allow for more variability. Um, but the um, idea there is to um, um, basically um, look at the production capability of the land um, and um, um, certainly, as we've experienced the last two or three years um, with regards to the enhanced government program payments, um, the uh, um, property taxes would have likely increased um, quite a bit um, without this process. And so um, um, in some respects, you have a dichotomy in uh, um, 2019 and 2020 where agricultural incomes were pretty high um, because they were, um, large injections um, into the agricultural sector from the government, um, but um, that um, did not push um, the uh, um, LNIs higher simply because of the way that those are calculated. With that, unless there are no other questions, we uh, um, thank you for um, jumping on and hopefully this increases your understanding of the use value approach. Um, in terms of how that uh, um, valuation is determined that then will go to uh, the counties to determine um, what the mill levy is. Um, with that, next week, we'll end the three week uh, sessions here where we'll actually take a look at um, what the uh, income situation was in 2020. Um, some of the distributions there, looking at it from a regional basis, farm type basis. And then we'll also take a look at, uh, um, based on current information, um, what we may be looking at for um, net farm income numbers for 2021 and 2022. So with that, um, have a good rest of the day and hopefully we'll see you next week.